Okay, I would like to introduce um, from the Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority, Will Pickering, who is the oh. director, communications, communications manager. Yeah. Communications manager. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Will. Oh, okay. Just, it doesn't amplify you; it just records your voice. Got it. So on behalf of PWSA, we want to welcome everyone from CLA here tonight. Uh, it's a really exciting time of year. We get to host this group uh, twice a year here at our Aspen Wall Water Treatment Plant. Um, and first, just want to begin by commending you all for, for taking your free time and doing this. I think this program is uh, just a really great initiative to learn about not just PWSA, but you know our city, all the different services that public authorities and departments provide. And we hope that you get something out of uh, this presentation and tour today so you get a better understanding of everything that we do and globally some of the challenges that PWSA is facing that maybe you haven't seen on the news or read in the newspaper. Um, and we also want to get to your, to your questions. And so we'll do our best to, to keep the itinerary moving and keep the agenda moving. We have folks from our different divisions that are going to get in depth on certain topics and then we'll open it up for a brief Q&A and then any questions that um, you know may may go into a little more depth than we're able to cover as a group uh, we're participating in your slack messenger service and so we'll be able to answer those offline online um, so again just on, on behalf of PWSA welcome and I'm going to kick it over to our director of finance Kent Lindsay who's going to talk all about numbers and money Thank you. Well, good evening, and, and thank you for coming. Um, so I'm Kent Lindsay. I'm the finance director. Yes. Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, James. Uh, my name is Kent Lindsay. I'm the finance director at uh, Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority, and. Uh, Tonight I wanted to talk a, about a, something a little different than you typically would see in a finance presentation. Yeah, we do all the accounting, right? We do the payroll, we cut checks, we do the procurement, we do all those back office things. But one of the most important things we've been engaged in this year has been planning. And we've taken a totally different approach to planning uh, at PWSA. And I'm pretty excited to roll this out. This is the first audience that will that will see kind of what we're doing. But but it's a total change in uh, how we do things. Um, so we're about to transform the organization. Y you've heard lots of things in the news and lots of things that have been going on, but what's key for us is to change how we do things. Historically, this organization has been run such that you know we figure out what we need to do to fit within the confines of a budget and a budget that was developed I don't know in 1942 or something but it, a long long time ago right and the the next budget got escalated by a couple of percent and a couple of percent and it really didn't reflect what needs to be done with the organization we've taken a holistic look what do we need to do as an organization. We need to have clean water. We need to deliver clean water. We need to have uh, conservation. We need to make sure we're not wasting water. We need to be responsive to outages and breaks. And there are industry standards around how you should deliver this service. We've taken a look at those industry standards and we've started to put those things into place. And metrics from everything to how fast we pick up phones in customer service, how quickly we respond to an outage or a backup of a, of a catch basin, all of those things have metrics that are, have been established by the industry and, and endorsed by the Public Utility Commission. And so we've taken a look, what do we need to do to achieve those goals? And so we've really taken a look at, at every aspect of the organization and we've begun to now develop a plan that plan is uh, is about 80 percent complete uh, it's been quantified uh, and now we're ready to kind of think about exactly how we're going to deploy these things so we're, we have all of these things right that we've identified that we need to fix we need to do better Everything from water quality, system reliability, billing, financial controls, outage response times, all of those things. And so we've identified all these projects, okay? We're going to address the reservoirs, tanks, and our, this water treatment plant. You know, this water treatment plant is, uh, was built in the 1960s, and it, it's, it's in need, as many other assets are across our asset portfolio, of sub substantial investment. Okay? We have water mains and our clear well that need, uh, need work. 
we need to really look at how we run our system. And in order to run our system, we need to measure our system. Today, we don't meter every output for water. So there are places that use water, but we don't have a meter on it. So we don't know how much water is flowing through that, uh, that asset. So we need to meter everything. Until we meter everything, we won't know where our leaks are. Once we meter everything, we will know how much water comes into our system and then where the water goes out of our system. And if there's a difference in between, we've got a leak. Uh, these leaks aren't always apparent, and so we, we have systems available to us to be able to measure that. Uh, with that being said, um, how do you uh, measure the, the Sewage, like okay, the sewage. The outgoing. Yeah, so so sewage. Uh, we. You get sewage bills. Yes, you get sewage bills, and they're based on your water consumption, right? The the. So if you take water in, water's going to go back out, right? Right. There are a couple instances where that doesn't. Uh, large industrial users, for instance, will actually consume it. We have uh, uh, Riverbend Properties that, that, own, that owns a former uh, Heinz facility that did baby food and ketchup, right? They put water in, it doesn't go back down the drain ever. It goes out and, you know, goes out into, the, into their product. So um, those sorts of things we don't, but generally speaking for most businesses, it, it gets used, it then get, it flows down the, oh, we have a cheer from the peanut gallery. Um, so. Okay, so um, th that's how we bill all of this. We need to meter all of that, to measure all of it so that we are being responsible for the water that we are taking out of the Allegheny River. Um, all of this, all of these initiatives are going to require systems. Um, we do not have state-of-the-art computer systems, whether that's a billing system, uh, a financial reporting system, uh, or these performance metrics. Um, so there's a lot of systems that we need to put in place. We need to integrate so that all of our data can be viewed, reported, tracked, monitored, and action can be taken based on that data. We can move to the next one. So what's that mean? Uh, so this is, most of those items are what we call capital items, right? So these are long-term investments, uh, big systems. Um, historically, this organization has spent uh, between 20 and 50 million dollars a year of investing in the assets. If you were to look at these assets, um, y you, would, you would find out that if we had to replace this system, it'd be about 15 billion dollars to replace this system. And if this system had um, a hundred year life, right, then that would be 150 million dollars a year if you were to kind of have to replenish and replace. So every year you're putting in a pro rata share of that in order to maintain it at a reasonable status. It'd be 150 million dollars a year and that's appropriate for the water system. A, a sewer system would have about a 50 year life. And so, you know, now you're talking about 300 million dollars and frankly, if you're only spending, you know, 30 to 50 million dollars, you're falling behind. And for decades, this organization has fallen behind. And so we've developed the plan to actually invest the money in the systems. So uh, we've got, you know, there's some ramp up time, but in time, we're going to get to that $200 million a year investment level. If you look at comparable utilities uh, at a comparable size, that's what comparable utilities do spend on their systems. So what do you have to pay a, a year? on the bonds to uh, finance that? So today our financing cost is a little less than 3%. Uh, so we've got a, a, a pretty advantaged um, interest rate that we're able to finance this kind of investment at. All these changes, Mr. Lindsay, are they coming from the new leadership change? Or is this something that was in plan before the leadership changed? Well, this has been an evolving thing over, uh, over the last, well, since I came on board. So I've, I've only been here for about two years. And so um, since I came on board, you know, the first thing I had to do was establish, you know, finance guy, right? So I got to get all the financial controls, financial processes and procedures in place to be sure we're not wasting your money. 
Now that we've gotten that under control, now we've moved on to the big planning. And so this has been my effort over the last roughly year to uh, develop this plan that will get this system back to where it needs to be. So to piggyback my question, and I'm sure it's on many people's minds, at 80% of your planning done, what's, how much are our costs going to go up as residents? We have to take that kind of uh, we have to take that plan to the board uh, before I want to before I can get into you know rates and charges and that sort of thing um, that needs to go to the board get their authorization before that happens that's planned for either late this month or immediately next month but then that that'll come out at that point in time okay um, operating costs this is our operating costs this is. PWSA's operating costs, of course, we have additional costs over and above that, and that's the Alcasan costs, right? Um, I, you probably remember from your bills, you also have a, a sewage treatment charge on your bills. Uh, that's for Alcasan. Um, we don't make any money on that. The, we, they send us a bill and we send you a bill, and so that's what that is. So this is purely for water service and sewer conveyance service. So you can see that the costs go up, and you know, if we're going to invest all that money that you saw on the previous slide, it's going to take uh, a fair amount of individuals, a fair amount of uh, effort in order to, to deploy that. Make sure we're responsive to customer needs. And so that's what, that's what this is going to be. Maura, we can go to the next one. Can I ask you again? Yeah, sure. I don't understand, but it's real well. This operating cost includes maintenance, debt, wages, everything, rent on the building, all, all that stuff. Is that, that correct? That's correct. It does not include capital costs, but it does include operating. So things that would be expenses rather than investments. There's an accounting fine point there, but. So that, the previous question was, what, what amount above that do you have to pay every year on, on the debt you're accumulating? Our debt service is about $50 million a year. Okay. In case you were wondering about the details <laughs> of that very statement, the next, the next slide starts at about $50 million a year. But as we invest all of that money, you see that grows substantially. So just as that capital figure went very large, we fund it primarily out of debt. And so our debt service costs go up. OK, so that's that one. So what's all that mean? Well. This is how we run our business, right? This is our total, the total pie of costs that we have. You can see that by far the largest single share is that Alcasan charge, right? Debt service, as you were mentioning before, about 20%. So the direct expense of bringing water to your house is about 18% of those costs that you saw before. And the cost of conveying sewage away from uh, the, the customer home is about 10%. Um, and then we have some support costs of about 16%. But the rest of this stuff, right, 57% of our costs are fixed. Nothing we can do about them. Right? This is, this is what we have to work with. And this is what we're going to use in order to deploy the, the capital projects and the services that our customers deserve. So that's, uh, that's the end of my presentation. And I'm happy to uh, entertain questions. I'll ask you sure. It, it, it seems kind of strange that um, it costs more to uh, pay Alcasan to get the water to take it away than to treat the water. I mean, I, the plant has a lot of operating costs. Aren't, aren't you just great? You have a pump station or something? Why is it costing so much to, uh, to Alcasan? So the Alcasan treatment, that is their charge to you. And I just pass it through. I get the joy of billing it on their behalf. Is there a way to legislate that charge? With Alcasan? I'm not sure which. They're not. They're, they can't budge. That's what they say it is, and there's no way to make them realize that there's a cheaper way to do it. They're in the water treatment business, and I wouldn't propose to tell them how, how to do it. You certainly have as much uh, opportunity. They have public board meetings as well. They're a, they're a public entity as well. So yeah, they've, uh, 
they've got some material charges. A very large plant. They treat um, sewage from 83 municipalities, not just the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and they share that cost across all, all of those municipalities. And um, it's, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's based on uh, the water consumption at, the, at, the, at that location. Would that cost, could you make that cost go down after the infrastructure change to make, you know, less lead pipe? <coughs> No, that, that is for treatment of sewage. So that's not going to change no matter what change. PWSA and PWSA's the city does. business is quite separate from Alcasans. Okay, thank you. Certainly. Yes. Hi, uh, Mr. Pickering. You're Mr. Pickering? Lindsay. Okay, I'm second. Say, I'm sorry. <laughs> Will always goes first. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Oh, Mr. Lindsay, thank you. Uh, I have a sort of bread and butter question. Either you can answer it or maybe tell me when or who to ask later. I, I'm a paralegal and sometimes I work with seniors where maybe they've been in the hospital or maybe they've had a tenant that they couldn't sort of keep up with and things happen with the water that the bill gets high. Maybe there's a hidden, maybe there's a pipe or a, a commode that was let running. And I, I did read in the paper that um, when when there when the water gets turned off, when the water gets shut off, um, it, it it increases the chance that when it gets turned on again, that somehow there's going to be more lead in the water. So I'm I'm just basically wondering. I know I've heard about water exoneration uh, hearings, or so I wondered, you know, what they are and how how to be successful at them if you have such a thing as pointers on that. We certainly have an appeals process that uh, that uh, customers can avail themselves of um, water leaks and things um, largely uh, and this is industry standard practice uh, the Public Utility Commission uh, establishes standards around this uh, water leaks on customer property is customer responsibility that said we do uh, um, we do acknowledge that people can sometimes have a problem um, that they that makes it difficult for them to pay so we offer payment plans um, we offer uh, in some cases where uh, there might be a discrepancy in usage that we uh, allow people to um, to appeal their charges um, we will if if we can detect it ourselves um, we will make the change ourselves if uh, if the customer doesn't agree or we're not able to detect where uh, where a problem may have come from there is the water exoneration hearing board and um, there there's the forms at our website as well as uh, in our offices um, and if you call customer service they'll even mail you one where you can fill out a form to request a hearing and uh, you will be granted a hearing and uh, you'll be able to uh, present your side of the case um. Well, if 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 there is a uh, if there's a need to test for where the leak is, um, we can we can accommodate that. But typically, you're going to find an area that's wet. You're going to find an area that is uh, now. If you wait a very long time, you know, uh, it, it may get dry. But that would be a long time without water. So typically, you can you the, the there will be moisture where there's the location of a leak. Hey, good evening. Um, I appreciate the overview on where the projects are to take a crumbling system and get it back to where the investment level is meeting where it should be. But I, I think we all, and probably yourself most definitely, would recognize that water and the scarcity of water moving forward into the future, not only for the city of Pittsburgh, but for the United States and the rest of the world, will become even that much more critical to have infrastructures in place that are sustainable as well as provide the most efficient system. So in terms of the projects that are being rolled out and implemented, the work that's being done, what percentage of those projects are, are focused on maintaining the infrastructure versus actually looking ahead to the future of water systems in our city? 
That plan was built around uh, the long-term forecast. Um, we've taken a very long-term look. We have prioritized those things that are critical, those things that will have a lasting uh, impact for our customers to ensure that this water system is in place and in good condition and able to provide good service over the long term. So we have prioritized those items. There's clearly short-term ones as well, but we've, uh, we've gone in-depth on a prioritization. There's a lot of talks about um, the water system and budget and privatization possibly of the water services. Um, how would that basically affect us as citizens and we're learning about this class today and you're talking about long-term goals, but also there's other like deals or, or whatever, whatnot's going on and happening right now? There are a lot of discussions around those sorts of topics. Um, we can't control what's going to be done there. All we can control is w how to run this system as best we can for the long term. And frankly, whether it's owned by some other entity or um, a private entity, another public entity, uh, this plant needs to have work and the water lines need to have work and the tanks and the reservoirs, uh, the meters need to be there. All of those things still need to be done. So we have ensured that the investments we're making are things that anyone would use regardless of the future of the organization. John Wells said in May that it was going to take 14 years. Do you guys have an idea of what your long term for the infrastructure? We have taken a 25-year look at our operating and capital needs, and that has been incorporated into this plan. And just so everyone knows as well, there are you guys have your um, note cards there, so if you have questions that aren't un are unanswered, uh, Rachel and her team have joined the Slack, so you can post them there and they will answer them, or you can um, just put them on the card and type them up later, just to stay on schedule for for them. And we will That's okay. Sorry. Every question, whatever yeah. you send us, you get an answer to it. I promise. Awesome. Perfect. All right. Sorry. Well. All right. Thanks again. All right, so moving right along, we are going to kick it over to Barry King. Barry is our uh, interim director of construction and engineering, and he is also going to cover our operations functions. Unfortunately, our uh, director of operations was unable to make it, so Barry is going to walk us through that. And what's operations next? Mm. Yeah, do you want to do you want to do the operations yeah. presentation first? All right, kick it over to Barry. All right. Good evening. All right, so I'll be discussing field services, our operations group. I am the interim director of engineering and construction, so I'm uh, substituting on behalf of Rick Obermeyer, who normally covers this uh, subject matter, so forgive me for any um, <laughs> possible misstatements. I will attempt to make sure that uh, I am uh, on track with you. So, uh, a factoid for PWSA, uh, we provide water and sewer services to approximately or over 300,000 uh, customers throughout the city of Pittsburgh and surrounding communities. Um, PWSA, all of our water is withdrawn from the Allegheny River, it's all surface water, it's treated here at the plant. Uh, field services is responsible for the update and the field work with regards to any of the uh, infrastructure for the distribution of the uh, water. So uh, we have water pipes in excess of uh, 965 miles, uh, 25,000 valves, just about 7,400 hydrants. Uh, five different reservoirs, of which several have been in the news, we're in the process of updating um, many of them at this time, the covers to the systems. Uh, 11 storage tanks throughout our system. Uh, we can hold over 455 uh, <clears throat> million gallons of water throughout our system in these storage reservoirs. Uh, quite a significant capacity and a total of 11 pump stations for uh, providing the pressure within the system and getting the water to where it needs to be stored and distributed. Uh, water repair crews are essential to our operations. We have uh, really excellent staff that daily is responding to emergencies as they get uncovered. 
Uh, most recently uh, and most prominently, we've had the Lanford Rising Main repair that's been ongoing and uh, was completed. You can see here just the substantial size of the water lines. So the water that's treated here at the plant ultimately gets pumped by our pump station uh, up to the Lanfair Reservoir using a 60 inch rising main. And uh, due to uh, certain uh, issues I'll discuss under the engineering one, uh, we had a break in the line that was discovered and ultimately we repaired this by lining it with HDPE, a plastic line, uh, to repair it and bring it back in service. Uh, we have valve crews that operate throughout the city. Without our valves, we're really at a um, situation to be able to continue to provide service, so they're essential to our operations. Uh, anytime we have an emergency, they're out there to address uh, locating the valves, maintaining the valves, and opening and closing as necessary to be able to perform the repair services with little loss of water. Uh, hydrant crews, uh, we have a number of uh, crew members that are throughout the system daily. Uh, they do the testing to ensure that there's adequate flow and pressure uh, for any firefighting services that are done. And uh, they also do the maintenance and repair on all the hydrants throughout the system. Uh, we have a, a crew of plumbers throughout our system. Uh, they are responsible for doing the maintenance, whether it's at the pump stations or individual service lines throughout the plant. The uh, sewer operations, we have, um, I don't know if you're, it sometimes cannot be clear. Uh, we are responsible for the sewage lines from your sewer lateral out to um, sewer mains as they collect the sewage, but at any point the sewage gets to a common junction where there's multiple contributions from adjacent municipalities, that then becomes Alcazan's uh, infrastructure largely. Uh, so we're dealing with about 130 miles of storm water um, sewer pipe. Uh, sanitary sewer about 170 miles. We have 900 miles of CSOs, that's combined sewer, where water uh, from stormwater and sanitary uh, is combined. Overflow structures, we own 12 of them. Uh, we have four pump stations and over 25,000 catch basins throughout the roadways in Pittsburgh. Uh, sewer repair crews, uh, daily, uh, these guys are out there doing the repair and maintenance work. Uh, on individual sewer lines, we have um, up to 96 inch diameter sewers within our system. Uh, very large, uh, very old. They can be uh, as old as 1800s vintage lines, so they're essential for keeping the system flowing. Uh, inspection crews are using modern uh, tools. We have the CCTV, closed caption television services, uh, where they can go into the sewers and actually identify uh, damage to the lines before they actually result in a blockage or a full uh, failure of the lines. Uh, these crews are out there daily um, cleaning. Uh, we have a vector truck and um, we clean the catch basins. We also employ subcontractors for that duty as well. Catch basin crews, um, many times you'll see uh, catch basins throughout the city that uh, our crews are either in the process of addressing, inspecting, repairing. Um, we're trying to bring them up to the latest ADA standards for bikeability and passability. So, and uh, with regard to our future challenges, um, we are, thank you, <laughs> well done. <laughs> so c somewhat leaning towards what Kent was telling you, uh, we're in the uh, asset life cycle. Uh, a lot of our system, we have pump stations that date back to 1828 as our first pump station that was ever constructed. So we're in a constant cycle of attempting to renew and re rehabilitate as many of the uh, points of infrastructure that we have um, to get that out in advance of it actually failing. And uh, the cost of that is a substantial burden, but uh, as Kent had indicated, we are planning for that. And so. I think that covers, uh, are there any questions that you might have that I might be able to answer with regards? Yes. Um, for the 60 inch um, uh, pipe, yes. uh, and uh, somehow you pump some whatever pressure to, what is the amount of pressure water you 
that's it, like a PSI wise? Oof, uh, I would specifically have to get that uh, information right back to you. Um, that's one of the ones, if you can write down in your card, I can definitely get that to you. I apologize, I don't want to misstate uh, right at the current moment. Um, would you say that's 90? Okay, I was going to say 90, so. <laughs> The, yeah, the higher in elevation you're getting, the lower the pressure is. And so I think right at the site of the actual break itself, I didn't want to misstate, but my recall was that it was about 90 to 95 uh, pounds of pressure right at that point. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi. Um, so in, and I'm sorry I missed the first speaker, but in thinking about the fact that you guys have an overall transformation or transition plan for the organization, I can't help but ask the question of what role consultants are going to have um, in decision making that would affect the public in terms of safety and stuff like that. Uh, because what, one of the things that came out in the news that um, kind of surprised me and, and I think angered a lot of people, frankly, me, me included, was that it was reported that a consultant who was asked to save money for the system, which is legitimate, um, was responsible for recommending a switch in the chemical that ultimately caused the lead situation to get worse and so on and so forth. So thinking with like a public manager's mind, I have to ask the question, you know, how much decision making do we put into people who are basically their responsibility is just to save money? So what you're talking about is something that is a historical contract that no longer exists. Um, that particular contract, the way it was set up, was an incentive-based uh, contracting for the firm to, um, they would get some uh, amount of uh, payment based upon how much money they were saving. That is not the case any longer. Um, they're held as Kent, uh, you weren't here, I apologize. Um, Kent was uh, previously uh, scribing that industry standard is what we're attempting to go for, that we're trying to get clearly the most responsible contracting that we can uh, in place with all the consultants moving forward so that anything that they are doing is they're held to the re responsibility to achieve um, industry standards and in everything that they're producing so we acknowledge what you're questioning I would also add that wherever possible we have EWSA project managers and staff managing the consultants very it's not point. consultants managing consultants any longer yes. So we've been very careful to, you know, eliminate that step as well. And the authority is also in the process. Um, the Human Resources Department, as many positions as we can fill with PWSA employees over time, with the increasing percentage you will see us, uh, the demographic of PWSA changing such that there's a decreasing amount of consultants and an increasing amount of permanent employees for the authority. Hello. Hi. Um, well, you know how it is, like living in Pittsburgh, the townies, we're always talking and we're always being told how old our infrastructure is. It's so old. It's on its last legs, right? So, but you're an engineer. Um, there's like uh, some talk about how our stormwater uh, sewage systems are all like blending in with like, you know, um, other forms of... Uh, of drinking water or whatever and it all empties out into the Allegheny River like what what's going on with that like how much truth is that is there to that where so I don't want to steal James thunder so after me for engineering and construction James will be touching on our green plan and uh, the storm and uh, sanitary discussion will go on then Basically, my question was, as far as the substructure of that sewage line, um, I, I recently acquired a home, and in the alleyways and behind my house, it's, uh, I guess, uh, looking at this map, it says Pennsylvania American has it, but a couple blocks over is Bell Suver. Well, during the course of the day in my job, the alleyways are the same, and it's like they're potholes and like you could tell that 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 alleyways caving in and it's behind the homes so i'm saying the sewer systems i guess deteriorating but i've called for for residents 
both companies and my own I I've still have yet to have someone come out to survey this alleyway. I mean, th there's potholes to s the size it'll take your car out. So, I mean. If you could definitely make sure that that question is clearly stated on your card so yes, we sir. can do the research to figure out who has the actual right of way uh, for that alleyway and then try to backtrack to get that addressed to the extent that we can get that uh, taken care of. If it's us, if it's, um, you know, DPW, we'll, we'll figure it out. So if you can definitely list that on there. Thank us. you. Definitely. The, uh uh, where you have Pennsylvania American, they're, 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 selling, they're selling the water, but uh, does the sewage come to PWSA? Are you collecting the sewage or? Yes. Yeah. Are the systems cross-connected so that you can send water to each other? Uh, water systems are. There are. There are interconnections. So uh, for our system, we do have some redundant connections that we can receive. So you can sell back We can forth. sell. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Okay. Uh, 15 or 20 years ago, there was a chemical spill, I believe, on the Allegheny River, and it threatened our water supply, and it was averted. But what safeguards does the agency have to prevent something like that threatening our, our so supply? So we're looking at plans for uh, ensuring that there is water safety and that under certain circumstances, that being one, is your source water uh, contaminated or threatened. One of the things that the city has had a really um, amazing benefit of is the amount of storage. The 455 million gallons is substantial. And so it allows us to have events that occur um, that would, for a smaller community or for a smaller system with less storage, would force them to run out of water. We have a significant amount of storage within the system that has allowed, such as that particular event you're um, recalling, that um, we were able to close the intakes, not take any water during that event, and then bring the system back into service uh, with withdrawing water after all testing had positively cleared. So. Back in May, you said um, to the Pittsburgh Courier that uh, projects had already started, uh, Mount Washington specifically. So as the operations lead, tell us how much of the future plan has been completed. What neighborhoods have been looked into? What neighborhoods have had some effect? Where have you... Success stories. Success stories. Yeah, what's your success story so far and how long have you been succeeding? Um, can you be a little more clear as to what prod? Mr. Pickering said in May that oh. that Mount Washington was already getting lead pipes. Oh, changed. I'm sorry. Okay. So anything, <laughs> anything about this new future transformation project that you have success stories about? So we have had in the instances where we've been demonstrating the lead service line uh, replacements for the public portion of it. Um, Upper Lawrenceville would be one where we've had some um, success in being able to get the lines replaced and um, do it in a cost efficient manner. Um, the issue that we're running into and that we're trying to resolve right now, if you're tracking any of the information on um, how the board has approached this partial lead line replacement, we've halted any progress on doing partial replacements, which would be the portion between the main and the curb stop, which is our uh, PWSA's portion, and the curb stop into the house is private side. So if we were going to do any projects that required replacement of just the public side, Side, we have, and the private side is led, we've stopped doing those projects altogether. There's been a moratorium on pursuing those. We're right now evaluating a number of different techniques. One of them that had been trialed um, two weeks ago uh, was an epoxy coating e pipe um, going ahead and disconnecting the pipe and cleaning it and putting on this epoxy. We're awaiting um, test results on that. That's one possibility. There's other uh, potential uh, replacement technologies that we're also going to bring in. One of them being the actual replacement of the line by pulling it out and pulling behind it a new line. So that's going to be another demonstration project we're trying to get in place uh, fairly quickly. 
So there's uh, ways to which we're trying to combat. And then the other one that we discussed with the board that operations has been employing is a pipe bursting technology where you're actually taking a head through the pipe and bursting the existing lead line, splitting it apart and putting right behind it a new copper line. So you don't have to dig up all the yards and all that expense. So that's another one that we're seeing some success with. So definitely. Uh, maybe one of them is a question, another one is uh, my own personal problem I have with uh, wa the Water Authority uh, PWSA. Um, the 60 inches you're talking about is running right in front of my uh, one of my house. I, I have a couple of houses. Parker Street? Uh, Clay. Okay. And Shopsburg. Gotcha. And then uh, um, I think it was from May to, I don't know, I guess late July when it was you know, closed up and you guys were running the fire hydrant in Shotsburg, all of them. And then what I would like, I think was way maybe beginning May, I got a maybe at least two inch of water in my basement. And it's not, well, it didn't rain for like three days. And I thought about this water is coming from that a fire hydrant you guys are dumping into uh, what you call basin, whatever, going down to the sewer. But eventually, maybe didn't make it. Just went and sipped under the wall, um, under the ground. I went into my basement, and I called PWSA so many times to come and look at what I call see what's happening. They all they said, oh, we look at it. There's no way this water is gonna make it to your house. Uh, and I watched it for a long time, and this was happening. It was getting just little, little every time. And when you guys fix it, line it up the up pipe. And the water stopped. Now I've been getting rain all this time. I never had any water coming in. And the tenant was in, and they have a lot of stuff in the basement, including clothing, material. They all got damaged. And my um, <coughs> flood insurance couldn't take it because it's not my personal stuff. So sh sh they, these people have their own, what do you call it? They have to deal with it, and I can't help it. They're, they keep asking me, what can I do? How can I get my stuff replaced? That's one of the problem I'm having, I'm still facing. The second thing, um, going back to that pipe you're talking about, you just line it up. And I think if I remember, or lining is something when a pipe crack underground, maybe shift, you push a, what you call it, like a line through it to just get a bypass so this sh it shouldn't be an obstacle. And usually when I talk to some plumbers, they say this probably should last about five to 10 years. Is that true? Not in this instance. What we did is we uh, threaded through the 60 inch pipe of 48 inch HDPE line. So it's full replacement of inside of the pipe using it as a conduit. And so that has the full life um, expectancy that the HDP, any other new line that we're putting in, it's going to be just as long as any of those. So we definitely, I hear what you're saying, but this isn't the same uh, technique. This is absolutely uh, replacing on both ends where we disconnected the existing line, took them out. We um, had the welders form new transition fittings and the line in between is completely replaced. You replaced the 60 inch line with the 48 inch line? Correct. So you were at, now your pumping costs are a lot higher. No, not necessarily. It's, and so the demands that we had back when the system was originally designed aren't the same. The industry has changed within Pittsburgh, so we're not having to pump the same rate. So we did all the analysis, and it's commensurate to, and because of some of the C factor, the smoothness factor of the pipe, it's making up for whatever the decrease uh, flow capacity would be. I have I, my question yes, is about the land for reservoir. Yeah, you know, I thought I live in the north side, so I can see like we're right in that run. But I thought that they would have been able to keep it like to that side of the river. You know, doesn't that all that run through here? Um, I'm not positive if I'm following. Forgive me for the second. Can you say that one more? We had a problem. I, I can't even tell you how long ago it was with the dead deer in the in the reservoir and all that. And they wanted to boil water. They had a boil water warning and all that. Mm -hmm. But I was just kind of surprised it, it dragged on because I thought uh, that that portion, that side of the city, like I can see it in the north side. You know, we would have been Millville and us and like along here. And but um, like Lawrenceville and all that, I thought they could have drawn their water from another source. You know, they wouldn't have been involved in that that long. 
Yeah, um, the way our system is connected and some of the altered um, water pathways that we're on now with the fact that we have the Highland One Reservoir offline, the MFP plant is uh, currently offline, that there are some extended uh, networking within the system. So as a precaution, as um, Bob Weimer had said on a couple of different interviews, uh, a uh, high level of precaution that we made the decision in the state had encouraged the decision to do the boil water as we Im implemented it. All right, so I'm going to talk more towards what uh, my day-to-day -day routine is. Um, so with regards to our engineering department, uh, it's the Department of Engineering Con Construction. So we are responsible for the planning, the design, and the construction of new rehabilitated and replacement infrastructure within the entire PWSA system. Um, Planned capital improvement projects uh, routinely involve most of what I've shown here, our water pump stations, water transmission, water distribution lines, our storm and uh, combined sewer collection piping systems. Uh, as part of the engineering department's duties, uh, we have a responsibility for the preparation of the five-year capital improvement program. Kent was talking about that. We've actually extended that out to the 25-year mark to give us a good gauge as to what we're going to anticipate in coming years for lending needs. Um, <clears throat> so the projects shown here, that is the new Highland pump station. That's with regards to the Highland 2 reservoir. Uh, the pipe uh, that underruns the Fort Duquesne Bridge, uh, we're currently uh, rehabilitating that line. And uh, as I was discussing before, CCTV, this is an example of a pipe that you would see where you're running the CCTV uh, camera through and we use technology such as cast in place piping that allows us not to have to dig this up but run a new pipe inside of it and cure it in place to extend life 50, 70 years. Um, and a whole nother area of our work uh, is associated with addressing the more publicly visible projects that we have, which is our urgent or emergency projects. Uh, I wanted to point out that the goal of PWSA's five-year CIP is to move the authority away from projects such as these. They're usually more costly when done as an emergency. Um, that's kind of an obvious point in pursuing proactive rehabilitation and planned replacement projects. Uh, to this end, we have initiated many projects that have a clear assessment phase. Uh, we're trying to get out there and do a number of different studies that allow us to properly pinpoint which projects need to be taken in a uh, more proactive sense. Uh, interesting aspect of Pittsburgh's history um, and definitely the law of unintended consequences is uh, the beauty of um, the steel industry was the um, money that uh, Pittsburgh had received from it. Um, but in the production of steel, there is a waste component that's uh, slag. It was deemed as a win-win situation when the slag was repurposed many, many decades ago as a pipe bedding material. Um, what we didn't realize when that choice was made back in the day is there is a corrosive environment that is created by that slag. And so the, I don't know, if, um, how many had known, but both the land for Rising Main as well as this is Rising Main 2. These are greater than softball size holes. The slag that was used as bedding um, results in holes in pipes. This is a 30 year old pipe only, um, cast iron, you can just see the effect. So um, we're planning projects to try to avert those turning into urgent emergency projects. So uh, water quality projects, uh, another responsibility of engineering construction is addressing projects that specifically relate to the uh, water quality uh, with respect to storm and combined sewer infrastructure. Uh, within the uh, stormwater and sewer, um, I don't want to get too much into James's uh, subject, so I'm going to allow him to discuss that subject ever more dearly. Um, but that is definitely one subset um, that we get involved with our department. 
And then uh, another one that, again, James will be speaking to is our flooding abatement projects, such as uh, projects that would avoid um, the capacity issues that can be exhibited within combined sewers when you have an extremely high rainflow. Uh, there is the potential for backup, so there are a number of different systems that uh, James's group has been working towards. Um, green infrastructure is the overarching uh, subject that we uh, reference them as that have uh, helped with that subject. As we had stated here, engineers manage a structured program to deliver defined service levels at acceptable risk. Um, <clears throat> It's the goal of our department to manage capital program to deliver assets um, uh, within the uh, least uh, life cycle cost of the asset, but with the uh, uh, least amount of risk as well to the customers and to our infrastructure. Uh, these assets include the wastewater treatment plant you'll be touring tonight and uh, water pump stations, our water storage facilities and distribution networks throughout the city. And um, back to industry standard, we are now employing in our projects um, risk managed methodologies. So we are trying to uh, do uh, assessments and investigations throughout our system um, that allows us to see what is the most uh, potential for risk of failure as well as the most critical infrastructure for delivery of quality water and uninterrupted water supply. And then our implementation of those projects based on those findings. And then um, life cycle costs as I've noted um, the cost of an asset over the life uh, of the uh, infrastructure. This is an example for our rising main. So basically rising main two you were looking at an installation date somewhere back in 1858, um, the initial startings of it all the way up through 1900. And so there's limited maintenance uh, requirements, obviously, once the infrastructure's in place. But in the 1960s, the authority went under a full rehab of a lot of the major uh, pipelines, um, doing the cement lining of the lines. So you get another bump in expenditures over that life cycle. And then again, when you're kind of getting to the end of the life uh, expectancy of that infrastructure, there's going to be that for some reason is a reduced hump, there's probably a much larger expenditure that would be required to either thoroughly rehabilitate it or replace it. And then you can see uh, for there's a different life cycle and life cycle costs that's associated with uh, vertical assets. Horizontal assets are what we term anything that's buried like pipelines. Um, and vertical assets are any of the treatment facilities, the above ground infrastructure pump stations. And you can see there's multiple times that that sort of infrastructure has um, expenditures throughout its life cycle. And so as Kent was stating, our 2017 to 2021 uh, five year CIP investment, uh, our water distribution uh, network is where a lion's share of the expense is going, um, both by virtue of the volume and the current state of it. Uh, buried infrastructure is far easier to not um, uh, be able to see the current state of it, so it can get to a point where it needs uh, desperate attention, and there's portions of our system where we are endeavoring to um, get those portions repaired in advance. Uh, so our immediate capital improvements, we are currently in the process of completing these projects. Um, electrical power uh, within the Aspenwall water treatment plant as well as Aspenwall and Bruck and Pump stations. Uh, <clears throat> the water treatment plant pre-treatment and clarification improvement project is underway and ongoing. Uh, we are looking at the clear well uh, that may be a subject matter that you guys will get into into your uh, discussion. Uh, basically the infrastructure, it's a very large storage reservoir that after <laughs> all the treatment is held to allow it to have the contact time for cl uh, disinfection. That we're looking at a emergency uh, system so we can continue to provide water service while that gets um, updated and uh, a number of the other projects that are underway. And then um, kind of going towards some of what uh, 
the operations side of things. We do have capital projects where we are doing uh, operational based uh, replacements, the catch basin replacement. Um, so some of the portion of the work that is undertaken by ops, we do a larger program that um, where it requires designs for the replacement of the catch basins and contractors to install them. Um, that's uh, typical of one of them. You can see right now the very largest uh, single uh, operating cost for replacements is the lead service line program. It had been projected for this year at a spend of 16 million. Um, obviously it's not quite at that level at this point, but we're anticipating ramping up to it. And uh, continuing as well, you can see um, just one point, the largest one identified there is the Landford Reservoir Rising Main. Um, that is the cost that would be seen um, to replace the entire main. Uh, what we're looking at doing is acquiring the easement and putting a redundant main running up so that we do have a... Uh, insurance that we have two lines that we can rely on and wouldn't have the issue that we had when the 60-inch um, main uh, failure had occurred. So, And then just to give you kind of a gauge of the time frames that we're talking, for a project that's under a million dollars, it's interesting to see that that can be um, within a year to no more than two years to get it through the full planning design permitting. Um, bidding it uh, publicly, then construction, startup, and close out. Whereas a larger, much larger project, um, um, such as a mechanical project, we establish that as a type D that can be as uh, over $10 million. That can be a six year prospect to get that through the full life cycle. So it's definitely uh, no small undertaking. So are, are there any questions? Yes. Okay. You were saying, um, which was very interesting, how uh, your job as an engineer is sort of to make these impactful decisions for the future of the water company to make your assets as long as lasting as possible on a cost basis. But you mentioned in your history that um, a once innovative idea of using recycled slag from the steel mill actually resulted in the piping that you laid to have a shorter uh, working life. So how does that affect, like, and I'm just asking out of curiosity, I'm a like, techie, tech shop guy. Yeah. Um, how does that affect your decision making now, where you're like sometimes faced with innovative solutions, but like looking back in your history, some of your innovative solutions had, you know, Agreed. unforeseen consequences. Absolutely. So some of that goes to um, abiding by the national uh, standards. And so um, anything that's in interface with the drinking water has to be what's termed NSF 61 certified. So it's a very rigorous program that the federal government has implemented that um, allows all materials to be absolutely tested for um, off-gassing and longevity and unintended consequences. That wasn't the case with how the slag was selected and uh, implemented. You wouldn't ever see that happen again, please Lord. <laughs> Um, you said you are now uh, following the industry standard risk management. Uh, what is something that changed that caused uh, PWSA to start doing that? And like, is that when you say we are now? Does that mean within the past few years or the past ten years? Like, what's the time frame? And also, like, in the context of how long you've been working at PWSA? So I have been at PWSA for. Um, two years now and I had originally come in and the function of the design manager overseeing all the capital projects transitioning to a program manager overseeing the engineering and construction and then ultimately I have been uh, placed in the position of the director of engineering construction um, so and forgive me can you uh, as far as the risk. So what we had done with regards to the risk, that probably was implemented in its first initial round uh, about three years ago. And it's kind of a change in the culture, a change in, so there had always been this reference to fixes as fail um, mindset. 
where you would try to get the longest life out of infrastructure until such point that a failure was eminent. We're trying to avoid that. We're trying to, because lessons learned, you see how much more expensive it is. Um, we can replace the full uh, Lanford Rising Main for 48 million, but a 300 foot section of it, it costs 2.5 million. So it's much wiser for us to try to do these critical assessments, try to establish the risk and the criticality of individual structure, rank them so we can choose the projects where we're getting the best bang. It's to ensure that the water quality, it's water quality and uninterrupted service, which are our two uh, primary keys to trying to select projects ensuring that we're not um, impeding the flow of water and ensuring that it is a continuously meeting uh, regulatory limits, um, quality water. Can you talk a little bit about the cultural change because no one's really talked too much about that. So it's, uh, as a lot of changes within an organization come, it's from a top-down kind of perspective. It's um, changes in the past several years in management and leadership have led to this only orientation and goal setting of trying to ensure that the money it's not unlimited that we're specifically targeting projects that are uh, for the best uh, impact to water quality and sustained water continuous water flow so that's um, really been incumbent the uh, director of uh, the executive director now that's kind of been one of his tenants from the beginning uh, coming into it, and uh, we've all adopted the same mindset. Thank you. Yeah. I'm looking at the map here that yes. was in the packet. It was for the water service area. Can you speak to why some of the southwestern neighborhoods are serviced? I guess it says by the Pittsburgh American, uh, Pennsylvania American Water. So I am not going to venture an uneducated guess in that. I don't know if any of my uh, coworkers are very well versed in why. So the, the portion that's served by Pennsylvania American water to the south versus our, our limit. So th this hopefully isn't folklore, but the way it was explained to me is at one point before that portion of the city uh, wasn't technically the city of Pittsburgh. So PWSA had its system built out and that system was always separate and apart. There was an opportunity, I think in the 50s for the city to actually acquire, it was like had a different name, it had its own treatment plant, just like it did, does now. The city didn't buy it, Pennsylvania American did, and that's why we still kind of have these two water providers in the city. So, so they're just the water providers, but I know, I'm in Minneapolis, I get a bill from PWSA. Right? That's right. So we, we still charge you that Alcasan charge that Kent referenced earlier that we're just a pass-through for. So even if you're a Pennsylvania American water customer, you'll get the Alcasan charge on a PWSA bill. And then in addition to that, we charge for uh, water or sewer conveyance rather, which because we still own the sewer distribution system throughout the entire footprint of the city of Pittsburgh. So there still is a cost uh, associated with that. So that's why you get bills for both. The Pennsylvania American water bill is just for the drinking water use. Who do you get your drinking water bill? And, and where do you live? Okay, I'd, ha I'd have to, to look up your address to see. You're saying in the map it, it's showing that it's... So, yeah, if you want to give us... Yeah. Hey, Will, ask her to make sure she writes that on the card and we'll get, we'll research it. Yeah, if you write your address on the card, we can, we can look up and, yeah. and let you know who, who your water provider is. And maybe we need to revise the map, so thank you. Uh, we're, kind of, we're kind of from the same area. Are you saying that, um, and I do get a bill from Pennsylvania American Water. Should I also be getting a bill from PWSA? Okay, all right. Okay, I'm not. <laughs> so if, if, if you live in the city of Pittsburgh, you should be receiving 
a bill from PWSA that includes your Alcacian charge and a sewer conveyance charge. And, and there's a separate bill for your drinking water. Yes, yes. Drinking, yeah, drinking water and then sewer conveyance, conveyance and treatment. All right, we can move on to the next section. Thank you, Barry. Thanks for pinch hitting for Rick. A lot of great questions. And again, um, feel free to throw anything on the note card and we can do old school analog, or if not, uh, if you think of something tonight in the middle of the night, put it on Slack and we'll follow up with you. Because um, I know, like me, you're thinking about sewers and water in the middle of the night and you can't sleep. So uh, we're going to wrap things up in the classroom with James Stitt, who's our manager of sustainability at PWSA. He's going to talk about our green infrastructure initiatives, our stormwater initiatives, um, and then we will wrap things up. But I'm going to hand it over to James. Thank you, Will. So as Will said, my name is James Stitt. I'm the sustainability manager at PWSA. And among some of the other things that I do there, um, all of the green stormwater infrastructure components fall under my sort of purview. Um, Stormwater is a big issue here in the city. We've already had a couple of questions about it. You've seen some other things. We've talked about the water and the sanitary sewage and the wastewater, but the stormwater is like sort of that third component of it that often gets overlooked or gets lumped in with those other things. We're starting now to really think about this as an issue unto itself. We get about uh, almost 40 inches of rainfall on average here in the city of Pittsburgh, which is quite a bit of rain. It's almost as much as some rainforest and tropical areas get uh, across um, the globe. Um, and a lot of this causes severe events and problems in our sewer system, which you can see in the next slide things like street flooding, sewer overflows down into the river where that sewage gets mixed in with our sanitary, uh, that storm sewage gets mixed in with our sanitary sewage and then has to get dumped out into our rivers, erodes our stream beds, ends up in people's basements, and carries trash and debris and other pollutants and contaminants into our streams and rivers. Why is that? Why is this system set up the way it is? We have what's called a combined sewer system. During dry weather days, the combined sewer system works pretty well at carrying that sanitary sewage away from your homes and businesses. These brown pipes here come down into the larger mains in the street. Those larger mains come down into the interceptors that run along the river. And then that drops down into this pipe that carries it to our treatment facility, which is the Alcasan facility down along Woods Run. As I said, dry weather, it all works pretty well. Now, in a wet weather event, rain falls, it gets captured by the downspouts in the street gutters and in the catch basins, also comes down into these pipes, into the same pipe. As I said, it's a combined system. Then that rainwater is now mixed with sanitary sewage. So it's no longer rainwater, it's all sewage. Kind of the same thing as if you were a winemaker and if you have a barrel of wine that goes bad, um, you've got a barrel of vinegar. If you take one drop of that vinegar out and put it in a good barrel of wine, you now have two barrels of vinegar, right? Because once it's contaminated, it's contaminated. Same thing with this clean, relatively clean stormwater gets into this pipe and now it overflows this other pipe and this treatment plant downstream can't take any more of it. It's too much water for the system to handle. They can't process it quickly enough. So where does it go? It jumps over this little weir that's inside that main pipe and then outfalls to an open pipe out into our rivers. So anytime we get more than like even a tenth of an inch of rain in some parts of the city, we're discharging sanitary sewage into our rivers where we boat, water ski, jet ski, kayak, play in the water with our kids and families and dogs. So. It's something that we're definitely, you know, have serious problems with. We've cleaned up our rivers a lot over the years, especially with, you know, the industrial waste, but the stormwater is still a big problem for us. And that's why we're under EPA and DEP um, orders to get this corrected over the next um, couple of decades, because it's going to take that to do it. The problem, as I said, it's a stormwater management issue. We have multiple things that fall under that. Things like the poor water quality in our rivers, the combined uh, sewer overflows, illicit discharges from um, 
industry and businesses, surface flooding, street flooding. It's been happening for decades and decades around here and the issue is not that it's just a flooding problem or it's a poor street design, it's stormwater management and it hasn't been part of the discussion in any of these things like street design and building construction and site selection for our buildings. So what we want to do is change that and come up with a way to address all of these problems. These are just symptoms of a singular problem which is that stormwater management. One of the ways to do that is we could build big giant pipes and bury them underground and just hold that water until it's time to you know, pump it slowly back to the treatment plant after it stops raining. Or we can do a decentralized process which is often referred to as green infrastructure and manage that stormwater where it falls. It's going to fall from the sky, we can't stop that, but rather than put it in a pipe, carry it down the road, put it in a bigger pipe, carry it down to the next street, put it in an even bigger pipe and create this problem of volume and velocity by combining all these pipes together and then we have to deal with it at the bottom of the pipe when it's got a lot of energy and a lot of power behind it. Let's deal with it before it gets to that point at the parcel level and at the property site. So this green infrastructure was a new thing to us kind of back in like 2012, 13 when we started talking about it. So we decided how do we figure out about this? We assembled about 150 people into a room for th uh, three charrettes and invited experts from across the country to talk to us and help us figure out a plan to move Pittsburgh in a greener uh, progressive way to deal with the stormwater and that's how we came up with this greening the wet weather plan for the city. Our green infrastructure program at PWSA is focused on water quality and improvements to the system. We assess the entire city looking at things like topography and land use and impervious surface and where the storm drains are, where the water falls, where it runs downhill and where it goes into the drains and gets into our system, into those catch basins. And then we started thinking like how do we coordinate with the other agencies because everybody's doing a lot of work. The URA is doing work, the housing authority is doing work, parking authority owns property, all these sorts of different agencies in the city, nonprofits and private companies are, are building, there's a lot of development going on in our city. So we looked at this as well. We don't just have a stormwater problem, we have an urban planning problem. We need to change our way and our thoughts around urban planning to include this stormwater management from the beginning. Because we see there's a lot of development occurring and oftentimes it's not until the very end of that project that they go, oh yeah, and by the way, where's my water gonna go? Where's that nearest pipe that I can put it in and take it away? I wanna get this water away from my property as quickly as possible so I don't have to deal with it. Well, as we found out with trash and recycling and garbage, you know, 25, 30 years ago when we started thinking about that seriously, when you throw something away, it doesn't go away. It goes to somewhere else and somebody else has to deal with that problem and it becomes an issue there. Same thing with the water. It doesn't go away. Downstream communities like Millvale and Etna and all these riverfront communities or the people that live in Saline Street and Four Mile Run and some of the other lower lying areas in the city of Pittsburgh all deal with that stormwater that falls on the top of the hills that people are trying to take away from their properties. So as I said, thoughts are now how do we, go ahead, how do we keep that water on the parcel, where it falls, and deal with it and treat it as an asset rather than a liability. Look at it as like something that's part of the design, part of the urban fabric that we're constructing. Things like permeable pavement. This picture here you can see just like it's raining outside right now. The permeable side is more like a sponge. The water soaks through. The non-permeable side here is very, you know, ponding and creates a lot of reflection. You can see the water just laying there. It's going to sheet off and find a catch basin out there in the street somewhere. This area is going to infiltrate back into the groundwater. Bioswales, things like this along sidewalks and streetways that collect the water, infiltrate it. The plants take up the water and draw it out. Uh, after the rains. Rain gardens on uh, private property and in large parcel lots are another option. Bigger things like rooftop gardens and green roofs, cisterns, using um, shade trees. Trees are great stormwater um, tools for us. They take up a lot of water. Mature trees can take up a lot of water and uh, evapotranspirate it back into the atmosphere. Reuse of, of stormwater for irrigation, those sorts of things. Creating constructed wetlands along areas that want to be wet. Um, people talk about, like, well, Pittsburgh, you know, how can you do green infrastructure? You know, you can't just catch the water on your properties because you've got a lot of hills and water wants to run downhill. And, well, that's great. I'm glad we have these hills because we know where the water's going to end up every single time. 
we know what parcels to focus on and where we need to do our work to get the most impact. We'll look at those ones in the low-lying areas that are wet all the time, places where people probably can't or shouldn't be building anyway. So create things like these constructed wetlands over here that then have you know, walking paths and nature trails and create these more ecological features um, that are benefits and assets to the community and creating greenways and connectivity through our parks and back to our riverfronts. Trees, planter boxes, anything you can do to keep any, you know, every drop counts. Hold that water back during the storm event, even if it has to overflow after the event and drain back into the sewers later. That helps us because it's that immediate peak event when that rain first falls that causes those overflows because the system takes all that water in at once and it can't go anywhere because the plant down at Alcasan isn't big enough to handle it. Next. Some other examples here. These are some bigger parks and projects that were designed within sort of the urban planning uh, idea. This is uh, this one here. You see these tiered steps. This actually fills up during a rainstorm. Most people aren't going to be out in the park anyway, so you don't have to worry about folks getting wet uh, you know, out there. But it fills up during the rainstorm and then drains back down as it infiltrates post-storm events. Same thing with this place here. And these become neighborhood amenities during dry weather that people can enjoy and um, you know, have events in and become, uh, you know, things that will help raise property values around these areas as well. Next. So some of the things that I've talked about, you know, it decreases the amount of combined sewer uh, overflows. It does help improve water quality because we're adding plants and other things into the uh, um, landscape. It stimulates economic development. People want to live near green space. They want to uh, work and, and, and be around green spaces and where the water is clean and clear. So it does help raise property values and stimulates people to bring businesses into these areas. And there's opportunities for jobs and workforce development because we've got these things that they need a lot of you know, TLC. And it's not like something buried underground that we have uh, you know, put in 50 years ago and then we wait for like uh, these other guys were mentioning it to fail before we dig it back up again or there's a problem. This, we're going to see that problem next week when potato chip bags and McDonald's cups start gathering in there. We're going to have to get somebody out there and clean it up. Or if those plants die off, we're going to know right away and we're going to have to get somebody out there and replant them or get some water into this thing if it's in a drought condition or et cetera. So. As we move into this sort of bigger picture system-wide thinking of utilizing stormwater as an asset and making it part of our urban fabric, you know, we're going to change the way the city looks, hopefully, and make it a better place that more people as they move in are going to want to see these things. Something, you know, the, an example here, this is Heths Avenue over in the Highland Park, Stanton Heights area. The zoo is kind of like in this area here. This is, um, you know, the neighborhood up in Stanton Heights. <laughs> And Heths, actually, this used to be a stream at one time, way back when. But when all these houses and the development was done, it was put into a big pipe underground. And then when it rains, all the runoff from all these roofs, you can see how dense the neighborhood is. That rain, rain's got to go somewhere. It goes into the pipes and then flows down into a pipe that's underneath the, the, the valley here. And then eventually out to the river if it's one of those CSO event days. What we want to do is re-envision sort of the streetscape as a conveyance for stormwater, bring the stormwater back to the surface through cascading rain gardens that flow from one to the next, down you know, a green path lined with trees into you know, a large field with subsurface storage. You know, like these are not just plants above ground. You'll see if you look at the pictures here, we've got significant engineering and structures that are below the ground that these plants interact with and that the water is then held back um, during those storm events so we can get more volume at each site so we can offload all these neighborhoods into one place. Cascading pools on down and then hopefully eventually discharge that clean water once it gets through these pools and ponds and, and constructed wetlands back out to the river where it belongs. That's where it wants to go. Using again that topography, the slopes and the hillsides, rain falls from the sky, it runs downhill, gravity takes it down to the river, and then now we've also got these folks that live up in this neighborhood have got a nice greenway that they can ride their bikes with the kids all the way down through the trail that follows the stream down to the river. Go ahead, next. Another site is the Four Mile Run site, uh, Junction Hollow uh, below Panther Hollow Lake. One of the areas I mentioned was that Saline Street in the valley down here. There's lots of flooding that occurs in this area every time it rains because all the rain from Squirrel Hill, Greenfield, and Oakland and North Oakland comes down into this direction. 
and ends up in a singular pipe system that's uh, at the bottom here. What we want to do is try and offload some of these neighborhoods, storm runoff, into the park and into the natural stream channels that actually exist in the park today. They're underutilized, they're degraded, and if we can improve them, utilize this lake as sort of a reservoir, hold back some water during a rainstorm, and have uh, integrated valving that has real-time controls that will look at NOAA weather radar and say, hey, there's a storm coming, let's block up this outfall on the lake, let the lake fill up. After the storm passes, let the lake drain back down through a series of constructed wetlands that will clean and purify that water and eventually exiting it back down to the river here at the bottom. More of what that looks like here, you can see some examples of what the flooding looks like. And this is not, you know, this is not like crazy rain. This is just a significant summer rainfall. It happens at least three, four times a year down there in at Junction Hollow where all these pipes, you see these red lines, these are the main pipes that dry, pull that water down. That manhole that you're looking at there is about right here in this intersection. And this is stormwater and sewage that blew a manhole off about 35 feet in the air. That manhole's floating up there on top of that geyser. Um, so this was from somebody's front porch. Not a good thing to have right out your front door. To do this, I mentioned the constructed wetlands. It's basically set up so that it helps purify and clean the water, that water quality that Barry talked about. You know, I'm sort of a, I have a degree in, in sustainable systems. I'm like a sy systems thinker. I, I look at big picture stuff and try to see how they're all interconnected. So for me, this idea of water, you know, the one water thing is, is pretty much the ultimate system we've got, right? It's all coming back. If we clean water, put it back into the river, it goes into the river, it goes downstream, somebody else pulls out that water, they don't have to clean it as much to turn it into their drinking water because every place we discharge, somebody downstream is gonna pick it up. Everybody that discharges upstream from us, up here, Cheswick, New Kensington, everybody in Natrona Heights and, and up the Allegheny, whatever they discharge from their treatment plants at their sewage comes down that Allegheny River and then we have to deal with any of those things. So like you said, you know, chemical spills or uh, pollutants and contaminants we need to be wary of. So the fewer we're putting back in, the less the next person downstream has to worry about. Next. This is another project that's uh, actually in construction right now and um, I don't think the, those photos aren't from this one but it's a similar type structure where we took an empty lot, it was a vacant lot that was overgrown in a neighborhood up in the Garfield neighborhood that nobody was using, had a bunch of junk tires and things thrown into it and garbage and people were you know just sort of ignoring it but this lot was in a great location for us. It was in a bit of a valley and a perfect place for us to do stormwater management where we could get the stormwater from all the streets around it and the neighborhood and off the rooftops, direct it into here, and then it'll get um, fill up during those rainstorms, like I said, and then dry weather days, it's gonna be a nice naturalized park area for the neighborhood to, to utilize. This is a Melwood Street project. This is a, a curb and sidewalk improvement to take water off the street and put it into some of these channels and runnels along Melwood um, to eliminate some basement backups and flooding on, on homes in Polish Hill. And this is a shady side project. Again, lots of reports of basement backups and flooding in some of these neighborhoods here. Um, but if we can expand our capacity and hold this water in the streets, uh, in these tree boxes, utilizing the trees to uptake the water when it's, uh, when it's needed, and then hold it back from the sewer system before it goes into the pipe, it goes into these types of uh, curb bump outs and swales, then it won't end up in their basements. Uh, and Sawmill Run is a large scale project with us and 12 other municipalities looking at the entirety of Sawmill Run from uh, the you know, outfall here where it hits the Ohio all the way upstream uh, into like Baldwin and Brentwood and those out, outer neighborhoods. We're dealing, uh, dealing with multiple issues there and focusing on water quality using the EPA framework for integrated watershed management. Um, looking at you know, chemical discharges and pollutant loading and improving that entire stream to create a nice greenway that um, you know the businesses along there won't have to worry about continuous flooding along there as well. And next, right out in front of us, maybe you saw it when you came in, we have this sort of traffic island that's in the middle. It used to be mounded up with flowers planted on it every year. It wasn't really serving much pur purpose other than that. Um, so we thought, well, we've got a lot of parking area around it. Let's take that and cut some holes in the curb dig that dish down and let the water infiltrate back into the ground. And it's been working pretty well for us from that front. 
I talked about the jobs thing a little bit. Um, one of the things that PWSA is a partner with the National um, Green Infrastructure Certification Program. We're one of the founding partners with DC Water and 12 other uh, municipal water utilities across the country and the Water Environment Federation to set nas national standards for this green infrastructure maintenance, construction, and operation of these facilities so that everybody's doing it in a similar way across the country and that we have people that we can sort of put through a curriculum program. It's a 40-hour training um, that is sort of like the LEED certification kind of training that uh, some people might be familiar of with for building construction. This is the same kind of thing. So we can look for certified professionals in this green infrastructure stuff as we open contracts and look for um, you know employees. So that was uh, pretty much it. Happy to answer questions on the stormwater stuff. I saw one over here. Hi, good evening. Uh, two quick questions. One, what drives where green infrastructure projects are implemented? Is it community engagement and support or demand or how do you do that? And secondly, um, as you talked about the Four Mile Run uh, project, I'm wondering if any consideration has been given to uh, prospect drive within Chenley Park. It's a dead end street, it's impermeable currently, it's large, it's a top, on top of a hill mm -hmm. as far as implementing some of those um, green infrastructure projects you're talking about. Yeah, so how do we decide where the green infrastructure goes was the first question. Um, our process, as I said, we did a very intensive process of, of looking at the topography of the city and where our pipes are, where our catch basins are, and assessed pretty much every micro shed of area that flows to a particular catch basin. We know, have a very good idea from our models ex at least, how much water is getting into our system at any one of those given points. I think uh, Barry mentioned we have like 25,000 catch basins across the city. So for um, a large portion of those, we have a good idea of what's getting in at that point. So we know then we've prioritized those. Which ones are taking on the most water? Which ones are you know our most egregious offenders? Where are we dumping the most water into the river? What sewer shed is that? Each of these pipes that exits to the river or goes into the Alcasanix interceptor as part of a, a sewer shed or a watershed, if you will. And some of them are have more capacity than others, some of them dump more in than not. So we look at that as another priority level. We also have in that matrix, is there development pressures going on, either positive or negative pressures? Maybe nothing's going on in that neighborhood and it, and it needs some attention. Maybe we can do a project and stimulate development. Or maybe it's a highly developed neighborhood that has so much going on that if we don't get in there now and help these developers out with these green infrastructure projects, we're going to lose opportunities. So those are considerations. Um, other things are community engagement, community you know, uh, uh, activists and, and um, people who are looking for this kind of project in their neighborhood and want to participate. The more willing partners we have with these projects, the much more chance of, a, or better chance of success for these projects because they are very labor intensive and takes a lot of work to get them off the ground and there's a lot of involvement. It's, you know, it's DPW, it's the DEP, it's uh, the health department, it's the local neighborhood groups, it's the neighboring parcels and property owners and it's the businesses and everybody has to be sort of bought in. So those community group uh, 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 groups are very important to that too. Um, and then the second half of your question again, uh, sorry. Any consideration that been given to Prospect oh, Drive? Oh, Prospect Drive. Yeah, I'm trying to remember where that is exactly in Shenley Park, but. Eastern side, right by Squirrel Hill, the dead end street. Okay, um, we are sort of, the way we started with the Shenley Park project was we began by looking at this from establishing that spine from the river on up so that we would have places to discharge any collected water from the neighborhoods into. Right now we're seeing a lot of development going on in different places, especially like over East Liberty in the Larimer area and even in, you know, like downtown in the Strip District and along um, Lawrenceville. And these developers are doing these great projects, but they don't have anywhere to put their stormwater except in the pipe that's already there. So we're trying to create these surface way you know, spines, if you will, of connectivity back to the river so they can discharge stormwater into a more naturalized area that will carry that stormwater back to the river where it belongs. So as far as Prospect Street, maybe not 
specifically, but as we move up that spine and look for opportunities to discharge and collect water from the rest of that watershed, that'll be definitely a part of the list. Right here. I have a space in Etna, so how do you guys, but Etna, Millville, and Sharpsburg aren't technically in the city of Pittsburgh, although we are sitting here in Aspenwall. Do they? This is city of Pittsburgh. Is it? Yes, this and that shopping center is city of Pittsburgh. There's like a little thing yeah, that grabs it's, out. Yeah, it's weird. But yeah. <laughs> where my studio is in Etna, it's in Etna. Yeah. It's not in Pittsburgh. And when the floods hit, um, it was basically all the communities upstream that caused the flooding down there. And I know Millville has dredged everything it can, and right. Etna has put in sidewalks that grab the water and take it out. Right. What does the city of Pittsburgh do to help them not flood again? Yeah, as far as like, well, Etna and stuff, that's that sort of upstream of anything we own. But in that situation where we're, we have areas of low-lying, you know, vulnerability, we are looking at, okay, what can we do there, but not just there, because like I said, we want to deal with this water in a more distributed network and do things upstream and catch that water before it gains energy, before it really starts hammering downhill and picks up volume and mass and power and not have to deal with it once it's at the bottom of the hill so much. Um, so if we can do some of these projects, like the one, uh, the Hillcrest project, that's all the way up in Garfield. That is like probably one of the highest points in, in, in the city as far as that's concerned. Right across the street from it is one of our water tanks. So you know it's got to be a high point in the city. Um, and that's, a, like I said, one that we're doing there, but it also impacts people that live much further downstream in that same area. So we're looking at you know any available parcels and land where we can work. If they're upstream, we have a different sort of strategy and tactic that we're going to take to that project. If it's downstream and in the valley, then we're going to look at it from a, a larger scale conveyance sort of par par portion. Yeah. So I actually live on Melwood Avenue in Polish Hill, okay. and um, I was at the Civic Association meeting in August where there was a presentation about the project, and then we got the letter like the end of August from the PWSA about the project starting, I think it was to start September 9th like mm -hmm. on our street, and there's been nothing. Like there's there's there are like fresh lines painted. Yeah, um, I think. But I, uh, there's been nothing. And it it's, was supposed to end like in July of 2018. I just didn't know. Like I went to the Civic Association meeting last week, and there was like basically no update or why. Like yeah, there was there was some last minute month. design changes after oh, okay. after uh, we had some survey work done, and they came out and they painted the lines, and we found some of the you know they come out with do the 811 call for the utilities. Um, some of the utilities were not where we thought they were, which is often the case uh, when this stuff's been buried for 60, 80, 100 years. Um, not our utilities, but like gas lines and uh, electric vaults and stuff like that. So there were some things that were not maybe where we thought they were. Uh, so they had to come back, reassess where where some of these things were going to be positioned, do some uh, redesigning of it. And I know it's moving forward, um, but the dates may have just shifted a month or two. Okay, so it's still like going to start like before the winter? We're hoping to get, yeah, some things beginning, uh, begin rolling before the winter. I don't know. Um, I'll have to check. If you want to write that on your card, we'll be happy to, to get back to you and find out exactly. I, I, I can hand it to uh, my coworker sits right in front of me. She's, she's the PM for that one. Right here. I was in a business. We had a, our spring garden. I'm in the north side, spring garden, uh, Deutsche Dam. And we had a meeting last night at this place called Threadbare. It's a cider house, a new business yeah. that opened in October. And um, they had the uh, permeable parking lot with grids and limestone rock. It was really cool. Mm -hmm. And I can see that being a major plus because that would have been a pretty good sized lot. Yeah. Yeah, those are those are really helpful, you know, and it, and it prevents you know all that runoff from the parking lot going out into the street and having to be dealt with by you know local sewer authority, right? Um, and there are multiple ways you can do that: the the gravels or you know permeable pavers, or there's permeable asphalt, like I showed you in the picture there. And we're experimenting with several of those things around the city. How much he said it was like half the cost of asphalt or concrete. For that setup, yeah, it's relatively inexpensive, I'm sure. In the back. Yeah, it, to make, try to make this quick. So one of the things that from a renewable energy standpoint that Google and other solar company, companies are doing is they're actually using Google Maps or Google Earth to look at rooftops to see what rooftops are 
good options to use solar panels. And so in Pittsburgh, we have this really cool problem that we have all of these houses and all of these buildings that have flat roofs that, to your point, accumulate water. And if they don't have anything on top, the water just gets dumped right back into the drain. So from a progressive green standpoint, have we looked at actually looking at the infrastructure in the city of Pittsburgh from a housing and building standpoint to see what type of incentives we could offer to either homeowners or businesses to create green roofs that would essentially be a pivot point for where the water hits either the house or the building and prevents it from even getting into the street? Yeah, one of the things that PWSA has had um, for the past couple of years is a grant program. It's currently on, on hold while we do some of this restructuring that Kent was talking about, but our green grant program um, was available to, um, to folks who were doing development or projects. Um, we would do like, a, it was, I think it was a 50% match up to $50,000, I think, for the project to do green infrastructure on, your prop on the property and on the parcel, and green roofs were part of that. One of the other things we're looking at on a larger scale is there's something called a blue roof. And it's a much simpler idea, but using smart technologies and uh, real-time control valves on downspouts of things like flat roofs, assessing the roof for structural integrity. Because we're in the Northeast, all roofs, flat roofs, must be uh, built to a two-foot snowfall standard, which is equivalent to two inches of rain. If we could get half of the roofs in the city of Pittsburgh that are flat to hold back two inches of rain while the storm is occurring and then slowly release that after the storm has passed, we could eliminate a large portion of these overflows. So we're working with a couple of uh, you know these smart tech companies that have these real-time control valves that stick in the corner of the downspout and will hold back that water. It monitors, it's, inner, it's sort of like, you know, um, cloud-based connection to the NOAA weather radar and it knows when a storm's coming, it knows, has sensor levels, knows how high the water's gotten, knows when to shut off and turn back on. Um, part of the problem though is getting, you know, a, a building owner to commit to something like that. When you tell them you're going to store, you know, a couple hundred thousand gallons of water on his roof, they get a little nervous. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a learning curve and that's one of the things we're working towards. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, I'll turn it back and uh, let you guys take, I think you'll take a break, but then you'll do a tour. As you're touring around this plant, um, I hope you, you, know, you get to see a lot of the stuff and sort of the back end pieces of, of how, how we make water, as we say. Um, we don't really make it, we just make it cleaner. Um, but there's a lot that goes into this and hopefully it'll give you a new appreciation of you know, how, what it actually takes to get this water to come out that tap at your home or to get it back down the drain and treat it back into the river. So thank you very much. My name is Jeff Turco and I'm the operations manager here at the plant. And uh, this is the only treatment plant for the city of Pittsburgh. This is where all the drinking water originates. Um, what we like to do on these tours is start with this mosaic here, which not only is colorful, it is also uh, a good frame of reference. So if we can, uh, this is the Allegheny River here, and it's flowing this way towards what would be downtown. And we are here in this building. And um, Freeport Road would be here, and the mall and 28 would be farther, but um, that's also our property. So just to take you through, because this is such a large expanse of property, it, we can't get to all of it, and some of it's outside, it's dark now, it's raining. But uh, where we start is we have two intakes at the river here, and uh, they're quite large conduits that bring water in from the river and wrap around the front of this initial building. This is called Ross Pump Station. And inside Ross Pump Station, we have five high service uh, pumps, and this is where the whole process starts. Um, these pumps will do anything from 50 million gallons a day up to, I think the maximum is 120 million gallons a day. Um, this building here also stores our chemical feed area and um, any of the treatment chemicals that we use originate here for the most part. Um, the water continues out of this pump station underground and up into a stilling chamber um, that goes through the water will go through a traveling screen. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to explain without seeing it. Um, 
the screen basically goes down into the water and back up like a, a cycle and it will pull larger logs, fish, whatever out of the water and dump them into a waste hopper. Uh, as the water passes through there, it goes into the mixing chamber area and our pretreatment chemicals are applied and the water moves into a center flume into this big building here which is called our clarifier and it's four separate basins inside. We'll take a look at them briefly. But the idea of this building here is when the pretreatment chemicals are applied, uh, we use what's known as a coagulant and small particles of dirt and microbes, whatnot. These things uh, will start to cling together in the water. It'll look like little pieces of popcorn. It's called flock. And what happens with this flock is it's denser than the water. It will begin to settle out and drop to the bottom of these basins. Um, the clean water, cleaner water, will go over top of troughs and continue into a conduit that goes underground here and across the street uh, we have our sedimentation basins. This adds um, a little bit more settling time for this pretreated water. Um, the water will slow down, continue to settle out and as it passes through the structure it will come back underground once again. Keep in mind this is where we are. Uh, it will come back to the head of our filter building. This building houses 18 filters, nine on each side, and these are mixed media, um, rapid sand filters. Um, they're kind of, we'll look at them too. We just had a huge rehab project with this, about a three year project. So, best way to think about these filters here is like a big Brita pitcher. You pour water in the top, it filters down through the media, and you get cleaner water at the bottom. From there, the water continues along uh, in, into our clear well structure. Um, this is, we had talked about uh, a capital improvement project. This, this structure is all underground, and I believe it was put in service around 1895. It's, it's very old. Uh, but it houses, this is where the last pH adjustment is, and uh, we add disinfectant here, and the clear well has about an eight hour time span from the front to the end. This is where the water gets into our distribution system. It goes under the river to our Brecken pump station, uh, and from there it makes its travels into the city and to your taps. So in a nutshell, that's the way the treatment plant works here. So I know that was a lot real fast. Um, we're gonna take a look at a couple of the spots here, uh, again, because we have to be brief. We're gonna look at the clarifier building, and then we're going to look at the filter building. These are the basins I was describing where we settle the flock out of the water. So the, the dirtier water goes to the bottom, and the cleaner water goes to the top and goes over these troughs towards this center flume. And this is where it goes underground to our other basins across the street. If you guys want to get a quick look, this is what they look like when they're empty. This one's down for repair. All this equipment down here is used to collect any of the dirt that falls out. It, it constantly travels and collects at that end of the basin. So is this water, is this water cleaner, is that water cleaner than this water? I mean, well, this, yeah. this, yes, this water is actually pretty stagnant because no, no fresh water is coming over the top of these channels. Okay. So that basin working properly, yes, that would be cleaner. Okay. So does it go like from here to there? Is that what happens? No, everything comes into this center channel, this flume in the middle, and goes that way. Yes, so no, normally. This normally is just the, all the way in over the weir. Right. This is just what the guts look like down on the bottom. Scraping the uh, any mud that collects the sludge, yeah. we call it, and all that sludge is collected and sent to Alcasan. So if we want to head back down the ramp. So uh, this is the control center here. This is the operating center where our operators sit. And from this system here, they can see pumps, uh, tanks, reservoirs, everything in the city. Uh, something's low, they turn a pump on somewhere, fill it, vice versa if it's too high. They can see station pressures, suction pressures, discharge. Uh, and also they can see all the, uh, the plant 
operations here, the treatment points, uh, disinfection, um, pH, things like that, and the flows, how much water we're bringing in, how much water is going to distribution. So uh, referencing the mosaic downstairs, so we, we've gone from intake, the initial clarification basins across the street, now we're coming back. The uh, walkway on the other side of this is where our filters start, and again, we had a big rehab project, so they are somewhat presentable these days. So we can, we can wrap around and walk out there. There's nine filters on this side, nine on this side, and uh, again, ref referencing the Brita pitcher, the water comes in. We're actually under this floor are two flumes. We're actually standing on water right now. Um, the water comes up here through a structure and down through the flumes, and each uh, filter has its own valve, an influent valve that allows water in on top of the media, and by gravity it filters down through the bottom and is regulated by a valve, a butterfly valve uh, on the effluent. And that's how they set individual rate for each filter, which combines into our overall filtered rate. Um, that smell, the chlorine smell, uh, we add downstairs, we, we add uh, sodium hypochlorite at the beginning and at the end for our disinfection. And uh, beyond this building, the water goes through a 96 inch structure underground into our clear well. And that's the last stop before it goes to distribution. So that's about it. Uh, if anybody has any questions. What's that filter material made of? Uh, the, top, the top layer is anthracite coal. And then sand underneath that? Yes, yeah, exactly, yeah. Anthracite? Anthracite coal. They use it because it's so jagged, it has more surface area than most materials. I hope it's local. I didn't, I never asked. So how long did that last before you have to get some new stuff? I don't know what the correct expectancy is on that, but uh, the last beds that we had, 20 years or so, it, it lasts a while. Um, we, we periodically, every 100 hours, a filter needs to be washed where we force air through the bottom of it and it will separate any material from the anthracite. And then once that's suspended, we stop the air and force clean drinking water back up through. It'll spill over those troughs and down into a drain. It's collected and then redistributed to the head of the plant where we treat it again. So that's how we keep the... So, the, so normally you filter down yes. and then you, then you clean it up. Yes, that's correct. Every 100 hours, yes. So it's about, it's about four and a half filters a day, I think, ish. Depends. So that's, that's it. That's what I got for you. Of course.